Okay, let's look at some a slightly crazy Rust syntax. If you've looked into the Axum web framework and kind of found yourself there and thought, oh, this is cool, and then struggled because the handlers that you implement have this very uh, odd syntax where you actually provide a, uh, a type param a, a sort of a concrete type in the place that it looks like you should just have an argument, like a variable name. Uh, this video is for you. So I am going to explain first what the problem is, or at least where it comes from, and actually describe that this is kind of a unique hidden feature of Rust that is actually quite general purpose. We'll provide a couple of examples of essentially implementing yourself, and then I might discuss uh, some alternative strategies if you want to provide a similar API without the without all of the complexity. Instead, you just get essentially different complexity uh, through the uh, yeah for the through the deref pattern, which is uh, almost a topic for another video. But we'll see um, how far we get. Uh, okay, right, so. Now is time to uh, go up here. So I am uh, opening up a web browser and we're looking at this thing, Axum, which seems really cool. I want a web application framework that focuses on ergonomics and modularity. That sounds fantastic. Um, and I kind of scroll through and it's like, well, this is great. I can create this router thing and I can connect a route with a get method and I return hello world seems all fine and reasonable uh, there's multiple myth uh, multiple paths that i can connect things to and oh look i can connect to a post method so that i can do that so that's wonderful now i go further and i think what <laughs> um, what like i can see here i've got path u32 but i've also got path on the left and the right what 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 is going on here uh and if this has confused you i i want to and in fact axon provides a complete fixability so you can have more than one of these in any place essentially inside your handler functions and it all seems to be kind of confusing or at least i found it confusing when i first encountered this so the uh so there's a there's an example, for example, of having a uh, a pagination query string within a uh, an option block and so forth. It or just kind of seems a, a, a little bit nuts. But in this case, we don't specify the query on the left side. So like, what's going on there? Because over here, we do specify query on the left. So is this important? Is this not important? Why does it happen? Um, all of that good stuff so let's open up the playground and to uh start actually a uh and uh, allow me to explain that essentially what axiom is providing so let's copy the um the example across uh actually yeah, and path seems a little bit easier to understand, just at least for the moment. Um, our async function path takes some uh, is binding a name user ID to some path of u32. But what this API allows us to do is essentially bind on the internals of the wrapper type so whatever so this path is essentially wrapping a u32 and what we are doing is essentially binding a name to just the internals and essentially we no longer have access to the path object inside uh, uh, inside the path function um, so we can't actually access any of its methods here uh, if I wanted to uh, do that, I would now have access to the path struct, uh, but but that's actually very unlikely to be needed in the context of an uh, uh, some request handler. 
So what on earth is going on here? Um, it turns out that here is a perfectly reasonable function add uh, that adds a and b together and 2 and 2 plus equals 4. The So thanks Rust. And on the left is a pattern. Now you can, you've can you used pattern matching in Rust before and it turns out that Rust is providing the ability for you to say uh, to provide any sort of pattern that matches and to bind specific parts of that um, to, to bind specific uh, elements of the uh, <laughs> to bind specific names to parts of a structure of, of to parts of a pattern so let's go to the rust reference and look at the function uh, the definition for functions uh, the syntax is the kind of meta syntax is a little bit confusing to read, but in the function parameters you can either have self, uh, which is the uh, which is a self you know the the syntax or a function parameter, and function parameter is some outer attribute presumably which is defined somewhere else. But the other thing is a function parameter pattern. Now. A pattern is, in this case, actually a relatively gen so pattern no top alt. It turns out that it can be uh, basically any pattern without a range, which is essentially every pattern, or a range pattern. Which <laughs> so um, you can pass almost anything you want into that left side. And you may ask like what what on earth is going on there? So uh, or like why would you want to do it? Um, so let's say we have our add object. Um, well one one reason you might want to do it is let's say that you wanted to be able to create some functionality that only could work with uh, a price object or let's say a price type. You don't want to be able to add arbitrary floating point numbers together what you want this the price system to sorry the type system to do is enforce that uh, you are always dealing with a with a price uh, when you perform this addition uh, we're going to have a l I'm going to need to now normally you can do this quite happily with a uh, with what you're used to, we define um, an add. We put our type specify. Oh, only functions. Been, oh, we don't actually need to specify the types because that's actually we don't. We're not using generics. And this probably. So we get again a plus b is uh, is four. Now. But you might think, wouldn't it be nice to somehow avoid having to call the inner at uh, inner field? If I add price here, I am now creating a pattern. So it looks like a type, but actually it's the pattern of a tuple struct or a tuple struct. I still haven't figured out exactly which one to call it. Now, because it's read only, we probably only need a reference to prices we don't need a price specifically but now I can remove the, the field accessor uh, I'll need to change what I call uh, add-on and uh, now it works so I have uh, been able to add the types of safety on the right by requiring my uh, my addition function to only accept two price types or two price values and but actually in the implement internals of my myth of my function I only care about adding the floating point numbers which are kind of inside the price are you with me 
<laughs> probably not but if you are watching that uh you may be thinking as i sometimes do why on earth would you bother uh and normally you wouldn't or at least i'd say that you need to find yourself with a convincing reason why to bother because in this case it, like the syntactical overhead of adding price in both places almost doesn't really justify the fact that you've been able to remove uh, dot zero from two places. It kind of provides a convenience, like you can never forget, you can never get it wrong. Uh, and the compiler is doing the work of accessing the fields in a type safe way, and that's useful. But yeah, I mean, the heavy lifting of, uh, you know, it's up to you to say that there might be some rationale for um, doing this. And, and that's obviously you as the API designer, uh, because you actually are the... I want to show you though, just, just confirm that this is actually slightly more general purpose than just being able to provide accesses to, or like convenient access to the inner field of some wrapper type. It's not some special macro that Axum has created. Uh, uh, I can create an add method that takes, say, example, a product that has a price field and I'll just add dot dot to uh, sort of provide the rest, um, just to allow me to omit the rest of the parameters. And I want to assign the variables A and B to the internal price. And let's say we've got some other field that we don't care about. Let's call it a, uh, some code. This is also, well, I don't know. And you know, is for sale. Now we only really care about adding the prices together. Sort of wasting time adding some extra fields that I'm just going to immediately avoid, but <laughs> kind of fun. So uh, product, and then I've got my price. And I will just do that. And Oh, now sadly I'm going to need to implement, give everything a name. So this is my, so my two dollar thing, or like, and actually we'll just delete these. And the. Let's actually call this one the ball. And my ball can be two dollars, and and my bat can be twenty. So A and B should be twenty-two. Oh, and immediately get a syntax error. So let's kind of fix those up. I expected a price, but I found a product. What am I doing? Ah, so I haven't added product in the right place. I need to be, so all of this has essentially become a bit of noise. I'm like doing all of the pattern matching or destructuring uh, of a product. Uh, but actually, if we remember that the type system is really looking at the thing on the right for deciding whether or not this is the right type of function um, to send it to. Okay, field name is never used, so we can ignore that. But then our price uh, for our ball and our bat is $22 or 22 whatever unit you want to use. Um, now, there is a question like, why would you bother uh, with all of this? And are there any alternatives? We've talked around, you know, it's sort of up to you as the API designer or the person who's writing the code to be able to find a use case for when you might want to be able to destructure a struct like this, for example. Uh, 
it's an unfamiliar syntax, so there might be uh, some resistance from the other people in your team. If you were to suddenly introduce something kind of odd and weird, maybe point them to this video. And <laughs> uh, but there is an alternative. Let's say that you want to be able to a, an alternative with caveats. The uh, caveats are quite strong. They this is uh, a mechanism that is available for smart pointer types. Uh, and it is the deref trait. Now, so deref provides the ability for you to uh, specify a type. Uh, actually, allow me to explain what deref is doing by reference to string first, because string and Rust. Uh, work together to uh, make string more usable. String with a capital S has a deref to lowercase lowercase str, and what that means is that Rust will enable you to call methods that have only been defined on lowercase str. So for example, if I want to ask is empty and I go for the source, now note that I'm up in string, capital S, I get pushed into the lowercase s different like code. And it turns out that an empty string is length equals zero. Uh, and the deref behavior enables me to use strings with a capital S and in fact several other types as though they were um, lowercase str. By the way, lowercase str means uh, that the Rust compiler is, is, is confident <laughs> that the data that is at that memory location in some span of bytes is UTF-8 encoded. Okay, now in some instances, we have a wrapper type, and I'm not actually going to. Uh, so I can implement deref and full price. I want to be able to create some wrapper in our in this instance price that actually just is a for all intents and purposes is essentially a floating point number. Um, there are some slight problems with doing this. Oh, I say slight, actually it's fairly moderate problems with doing this in a very aggressive way because you confuse your users um, or the people that are calling your functions. So uh, now let me bring up my, uh, let me bring up deref. Uh, deref is a relatively straightforward um, method to implement. I need to implement this some target type and then uh, actually I'll take that away. Target is F32. By the way that question mark size says that the Rust compiler isn't requiring sized. Um, Now, all I need to do is self.0 here, I think, and I will return some reference, so I might return reference to that. It turns out that, so I think that is going to be right, and so now, if I just have price A and price B again, And then I try and add these two together. And I don't need an add method anymore. Or add um, function. Oh, syntax error. Deref isn't in local scope. I'm going to pull in the trait from the from uh, from standard not from core for um, K 
cannot add price to price, implement add to add. So, but if I deref, I can get access to the um, to the inner type without and. But can I call methods on? So I mean, you're like, what? What? Now, no. Uh, let's see if I'm certainly looking embarrassed. So I am able to call methods on float on floating point numbers. Even though there are no methods defined, or no implementations defined on price, uh, when I call, uh, use the dot operator and then call min, <coughs> min uh, this automatically inserts a, oh yeah, uh, but I need to specify a floating point number on the other side. So this is asking, dear Russ, can you please tell me the smaller side of A and B? It turns out they're equal. Um, so I'll change one to the other and our C should be two here. And it turns out, but I need to manually dereference uh, B because I'm not calling one of its methods. So the reason why you might use say deref over, you know, in a, uh, in a function. So what, one of the things that you can do is like create an add. We're back to our add and we're taking A and B. Oh, and I'm going to say A uh, is of type T and B is of type T and then I'm going to return and the syntax is going to be T as add output, I believe, uh, because it turns out that I've got another part of standard ops. So I need to say that this uh, implements the add trait. And one of the things about the add trait is that it has uh, defines a type output. So let's just kind of, if I go to standard ops um, and then go down into traits, there's a whole bunch of them. And one of the ones that I'm interested in right now is add. Add is a provides uh, a couple of restrictions, uh, but one of them is that the type on the right hand side needs to be the same as the one on the left hand side and that I also, but they don't need to produce the same type when they're added together. And so you actually have the ability to have, for example, system time uh, enables, you can actually add two system times to, or you can add a system time to duration and then they can uh, output some new system time uh, and I got it wrong so the right hand side defaults to self but isn't it isn't mandatory so you can actually com use the plus operator or the addition operator in multiple different ways let's go back to our core uh, our thing uh, so this will enable me to call anything a and b and uh, I'm probably can't compile naturally expected dot dot. Let's just try and what's a confusing error message? Oh, that's interesting. It's saying that it's okay to do this if you restrict add to types where the output is um, of type T. That's actually slightly different than what I wanted, but that will be fine for now. And it's also saying that I don't understand how to output. Uh, I don't know how to add two prices together. And so we'll just kind of say that what we really care about is the inner field and uh, we're getting very close to the actual point, which is to say that another type constraint that we can add 
is we could say that type, we can add two things together if we, if we can have a type T needs to be able to deref uh, deref and let's see if we can figure this out. What we want to be able to do is say that we can accept any T that will have an implementation for deref such that that deref is an F32. <laughs> Hopefully that makes some sense. So we need to deref target equals F32. It turns out that uh, we'll probably need to dereference things and we no longer use add not implemented for oh we're providing the floating point of oh and I return T but I'm not returning a T we're not returning a price we're returning a floating point value but we get we do get 22 at the end so now uh, so sorry about the confusion with the add um, with add there, it's not necessary. We can have, we can be even more generic, which is that we can we can specify something that dereferences to add that has the type output is F32. I wonder if that will work. So, uh, but this is getting sort of so deep in the weeds that I, Oh, that isn't actually what I want at all. I don't want a trait object. I'm just actually playing now. Sorry. <laughs> oh, we also need a right, a right hand side as well. Oh, naturally, the uh, okay. So that we'll just ignore. So what I one of the things I want to say is that your functions. Uh, so that. Let's go back to a summary. This syntax path, and we specify a sort of a type on the left hand side as well as on the right hand side, is part of Rust. It's uh, that's because what is on the left side of the colon is not a variable or some empty space. It is actually a pattern that can be highly uh, that can be completely defined by you and is very flexible. Uh, it's uncommonly, it's not common that we actually use this functionality, but it's there available to you. Uh, I hope that this has been kind of an interesting mirandering wander through some of the internals or some of the more advanced features of Rust and its pattern matching uh, sort of syntax. <laughs> and hopefully you've got some value out of it. I'll see you later. Take care. Bye.